Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. It's a real pleasure to see all of you. Some of you, it's the first time I'm meeting, of course, and uh, I think everybody else I know. Uh, we've almost come to the end of our journey here, and um, it's been quite an exciting one. Some of you have been in other sessions, and I really look forward to hear your additional feedback this time. As you know, what we have been talking about all along is about unlocking digital ecosystem potential by promoting entrepreneurship-driven innovation. And uh, without this, we are not going to have countries have the right digital innovation in unlocking communities opportunity. This session is about bringing together problem owners, solution owners, and resource owners. I think you are all problem owners, solution owners, and resource owners in your own right. Uh, one of the key issues that keep coming up during the whole session or the whole week was that you have a problem of collaboration, you have a problem of trust, and you have a problem of action. So even if people understand, they don't necessarily take the right action to be able to bring the whole ecosystem together. So our session format will be more of a rapid fire discussion. Uh, we tried this before, it was more of a fireside chat. So Nicola, be ready. It's going to be more of a rapid fire this time. So uh, I will be asking you three questions and then there will be a closing remark. For each question, you have about two minutes and hopefully you can do it in one minute and we can go on to the next speaker. The first one will be about what your organization, who you are and what your organization does or contribute to the ecosystem. The second one is about what do you want from other stakeholders in this ecosystem? Because there is always a problem on understanding the other stakeholders and having enough empathy to actually be able to contribute to the right value. And the last question is, will be about how can others access the resources that you have that may cost you nothing, but that's really super valuable to other stakeholders in the ecosystem. And last but not least, I will ask for a 30 style Twitter. With that, I'd like to introduce our speakers, Norman Schrappel from GIZ, uh, Dr. Bienvenu Soglo from Intel, Nicolas Berrer from Digital Switzerland, Lorenzo Niola from Hashko Lab, which is in Geneva, Khadija Hamuchi from Jolly Hink, and uh, Sean Melville, uh, from Ipsom Technology, and Eric Dehir from EY and Kiru from the government of South Africa. Uh, now I'd like to ask Norman for the first question, Nicole Norman on the floor. Could you tell us a bit uh, who you are and what your organization uh, gave to this ecosystem? Norman, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. So I'm trying in a minute, but maybe two. Um, Norman Treffel, I'm a Director of Digital Transformation with GIZ. Uh, you can read the rest in my bio, but I can say I love my job because um, we I have uh, two mandates, and this is basically support existing ecosystems and build new ones if necessary. Uh, that's a bit my, in my task. At the moment, I'm doing this in Tunisia, but we do this kind of uh, also with GIZ in the 120 offices we have uh, all over the world. Um, now, when I'm saying we support uh, ecosystems, it's very much... Um, trying to find out intermediaries uh, in the startup ecosystem very often, but certainly in, in, in the tech um, ecosystem in general, uh, and try to find out what they need. And um, going away from the narratives and the stories that are very often are, are taken up by donors and, and uh, implementing agent agencies and going to what's more impactful or certainly impactful. And very often it's, it's not a tech question that, that we actually need to deal with. It's more like how tech becomes um, suitable to the uh, clients, be it in the public sector, but also in the private sector. Now, the second is building ecosystems, and this is more when there is none. And uh, that might be surprising, sound surprising to some, but it's not so much if you actually look into the very particular field. So in Tunisia, I'll give you one example. We have a program that supports in particular industries, um, manufacturing industries. Now, manufacturing industries are not having their own innovation program, so our role is actually try to connect um, tech providers with those that put, can be potentially clients. A company that is doing galvanization of parts in the automobile is a very particular client. So in this case, we're trying to connect um, uh, um, and build new ecosystem on Industry 4.0. And I'm elaborating this in my other question. Thank you. Thank you, Norman. And I, I really appreciate the work you're doing in... Uh 
in Tunisia and other parts of the world. I, I think this is why we really wanted you on this panel. I would like now to turn to Dr. Bienvenu Soglo from Intel, and, and, and I'm biased towards Intel because I worked for Intel for 12 years. So, uh, Dr. Soglo, the floor is yours. Thank you uh, very same much. Same question. Thank you. Thank you very much, moderator. Please, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, uh, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, my name is uh, Bienvenue Abukoto Soglo, and I am the Government and Policy Director for Africa at uh, Intel Corporation. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be part of this distinguished panel. Uh, but first of all, I would like to talk about uh, Intel's purpose. So at Intel, our purpose is to create world-changing technology that enriches the lives of every person on Earth. Uh, and so our aspirations comes from Moore's law. And that allows us to continuously work to advance the design and manufacturing of semiconductors to help address our customers' challenge. Um, now, when we look towards uh, the coming 10 years, and we also look at the opportunities that are there for us to uh, use our technology to unleash the power of data, but also to drive increased value creation and social impact. Intel have launched uh, what we call our new RISE strategy and 2030 goals. So what is it about? Uh, through this strategy, um, Intel is looking at first, revolutionizing how technology will improve, for example, healthcare and safety. The second aspect is we're looking at is that we're looking at making technology fully inclusive and expand digital readiness. And thirdly, we're also looking at sustainability which is looking at how we could achieve carbon neutral computing to address climate change. All of th these three aspects actually enable through our technology and the expertise and passion of our employees. So what I want to talk about here is about, you know, the importance of the digital infrastructure, especially in the COVID environment that we are here now. Now talking about a concrete example, as we're looking at how to make technology fully inclusive and expand digital readiness, we have what we call uh, our Intel AI for Youth program. And with this program, we're looking at partnering with 30 governments and 30,000 institutions worldwide to empower more than 30 million people, including entrepreneurs, with AI skills training for current and future jobs. So I'll stop here for now and then you know, we'll continue later on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Um, Lugo. I think when I left Intel, if your job was there, I would probably love to have been in that position to actually drive these sort of things on the continent. Uh, and we'll look forward to hear from this AI for you, especially within the context of the project we're doing in South Africa and other parts of the world. Uh, I'd like now to turn to Nicholas from Digital Switzerland. Digital Switzerland is an organization we have been following and actually trying to promote in other countries. Uh, Nicholas, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mohab, and hi, everyone. You know, Switzerland is a tiny place. We're just a small, a small country, but at the end of the day, we are hub. And we believe um, innovation in the futures, of course, will happen worldwide, but will, will happen hub-wise. So you will have some small ecosystems, hubs, uh, defining strong competences in some topics, etc. This is what we believe with Digital Switzerland. We want uh, to develop the country as one place and not several places, but only one place developing some skills, for example, in decentralized technologies, in robotic, in tech for good, etc. And we do that while we take all the many stakeholders together. We mobilize forces, if I may say like that, from the government, the administrations, the startup world, the corporations, uh, the NPOs, NGOs, et cetera. And by bringing all these people together, we create ecosystems and we, we really try to develop it in order at the end of the day, it's about having jobs in the country. It's about having a prosperous economy and innovating economy in order to have uh, a happy society, if I must say, a last but not least, always doing it for good. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Nicholas. And then we do really like the fact that you talk about focusing on the problems and actually gathering the stakeholders to really come together around specific problems to get your ecosystem going. Um, I would like to turn to Lorenzo. Lorenzo, you're a next door neighbor to me. Uh, what can you tell us about Hashco Lab and what you do? Sure. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to, to be here. Uh, so at Hashco Lab, we, uh, we empower entrepreneurs. Uh, to build impact tech ventures that can solve the most uh, challenging problem of the world and drive uh, social change. Uh, we, are, we are driven by our desire to be a positive force in the world. And we truly believe in a future where impact ventures are considered essential to foster equality, better humanity and a sustainable world. Uh, we have a program for entrepreneurs. Uh, we have a global reach. We have uh, uh, ventures that are uh, really using technology for good, coming from uh, more than four continents. Uh, um, we are the third program uh, that just started uh, this month. Um, and we have a lot of partners, we work with more than 200 partners worldwide, uh, including different stakeholders, to really connect the dots within the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Uh, so different partners, such as UN agencies and foundations, and the corporations and impact investors. So uh, we're also part of the Geneva 2030 ecosystem uh, that is so important to really catalyze and foster more equality, inclusion, and uh, uh, sustainable change in several ecosystems. Thank you, <coughs> Lorenzo. I do look forward to working with you in the future. Now for our only panel, that is a woman. And Khadija, I know you're gonna light them up. So I turn the floor to you. Khadija is a remarkable entrepreneur and ecosystem builder and everything you actually want in a community. Khadija, <laughs> the floor is yours. Thank you so much for putting so much pressure on me right now. Um, I'm glad that I'm the only female voice in here, um, but I'm sure a lot of you are feminists in the panel. My name is Khadija. I was born and I grew up in Belgium. Um, I am originally from Morocco. Um, today, I work as an entrepreneur, uh, but also an international consultant. Um, what I actually like to do beyond building products is to actually um, share experiences vulnerably, because I think in the ecosystem, we really lack sharing um, each other's um, challenges in a vulnerable way, in a very honest way, in a way that is not glossy and that is so far from magazines or what entrepreneur.com is teaching you about entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, so today, my uh, the way I do it is basically by, um, so leading by example, and I am someone who does not, uh, who shares oftentimes how I failed, but also how I succeeded and the lessons that I have learned. Um, today, what do I need from the ecosystem is um, definitely on that personal level, Level other people to do the same because first of all it feels less lonely that's number one and then number two you feel like okay you just feel less like a fool sometimes of yourself um, and today how um, I'd like my contributions to the ecosystem to be done so I work as an international consultant I'm usually I do write a lot of research and I like when other um, people actually read it and give me feedback and share it with their own um, ecosystems but I think um, as an entrepreneur I would like those the stories that I tell about myself and the lessons that I've that I tell that I tell and that I have learned um, to be used by other um, entrepreneurs as a way to less sabotage themselves to uh, feel less um, guilty of whatever things that they have done out of sometimes just lack of experience. Voilà, voilà. Well, thank you. Um, we'll come back to you. I think you started answering the second question, but we'll come back to you with another question, which is going to be more specific about the current work you're doing and what you're finding out in countries. Um, Sean, floor is yours. Hi, everyone. My name is Sean Melville, and I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. I'm the Managing Director of Epsom Technologies, and the work that we're doing is really focused on helping persons with disabilities get access to technology. Um, in the world that we live in, you know, a lot of it is becoming more digital. And there's a, a large segment of the population, in fact, one billion people that are quickly going to be left behind. And so what we're doing is we are looking at what technologies are available 
and then making an assessment as to how we can help to make these tech, the technologies accessible to them. So for instance, the websites, the mobile apps, and of course, the assistive technologies that these persons use, how can we ensure that there's access to all of these things? So that's, that's the, the main essence of what we do. Um, the ecosystem in Trinidad and Tobago is quite challenging, I must say. And so one of the things that we look for is really partnership. Um, if it is that we're able to get access to uh, resources or go to market partners, we are able to better reach the persons that we are looking to serve. And so we've done it in such a way where we have small businesses that we provide support to um, in terms of website building, mobile applications, but we also do work with the community of persons with disabilities through workshops, um, specifically focusing on learning the assistive technologies for those who don't or do not have access to it, as well as in terms of upskilling. So for instance, there's a group of persons who you know, may have disabilities and they want to be able to create their own technologies. How can you train them to learn how to build an application? Or how can you ensure that they are using the technologies that are available to everyone else to be able to do the same thing and to be able to access those type of job opportunities? So that's, that's the main aspect of what we do. And then in terms of uh, the final thing I would say is accessing resources is key, right? Access to resources, access to partnerships um, would be some of the main things that we can really utilize if it is that we have to be able to expand our reach and our focus has been mainly on Trinidad and Tobago, but we've been able to get access to support internationally. So what we really need now is to be able to take this, these systems that we've tested, these different um, products and services that we've developed and scale them to reach a larger audience. Thank you, Sean. Uh, it's remarkable that you are both uh, an entrepreneur, but you also an ecosystem builders. And I think what most entrepreneurs miss is that they don't know how to do partnership in the ecosystem. And in the process, actually, to be ecosystem builders, because you will have to build an ecosystem around your innovation or your product and services to be sustainable. I'll come back to you. I think you started touching on what type of resources you want, which is resources and partnership very specific in your case. Uh, I'd like now to turn to Eric. Um, Eric, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, hi everyone. I hope you can hear me and uh, a big thank you for, for having me on this panel uh, in such a great international uh, entrepreneurial audience. Um, I'm a partner at EY, uh, based in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, very um, shitty weather if I may say so at the moment. Uh, and my focus is uh, on entrepreneurs um, and helping them grow and helping them realize their innovations, which is mostly impact-driven innovations. Um, and we do this with a network of um, startup ecosystems across the globe where EY is present. We are a global firm, so we have a lot of reach. Um, and my ambition is to help Dutch-based and Dutch-born innovations to reach their potential through the international network we can offer uh, and help international great ideas and innovations uh, to be launched into Europe through the network we have. Um, so ecosystem is very important uh, in both these ambitions. Thank you, Eric. I think uh, it's interesting you brought out this aspect of network and actually connecting your network to other network, uh, because this is how we still a lot of the time, if you don't have the resources, you can get access through other resources or other networks. Uh, I'll come back to you on this, uh, and probably when we start thinking about how could people tap into your network or how do we connect them, right? Because that's one of the objective we have is to help build them, connect them, and make sure that they're getting beneficial interest from both sides. Uh, I'd like now to turn to our last panelist of the day, Kiru Pillai. Kiru Pillai is from the government of South Africa, and we've actually started a project in South Africa. Uh, Nicholas, you'll be happy to know, which is similar to trying to replicate some similar elements of digital South Africa into something we'll call a digital acceleration transformation center. 
very long, complex, but is going to be pushing something called Brand Digital South Africa. Uh, Kiru, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Mo. Uh, hello, everybody. So uh, my name is Kiru Pule. I'm a chief director at the South African Department of Communications and Digital Technologies. The department itself has a fairly broad mandate. Uh, it includes the mandate, but it also includes the mandate for 4R emerging technologies and digitization across government. Uh, that mandate must be seen in conjunction with other initiatives that we run in, 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 within the department. And one, one is trying to define the digital economy by what we call the digital economy master plan. Uh, and the DTC, the digital transformation center that Mo is referring to, is actually a legacy project that emerged from Africa's hosting of ITU World, South Africa's hosting of ITU World in 2018. And it is seen very much as an operational arm of these digitization projects across government. Uh, so what we are talking about here, we are, we are talking about interrogating the various innovation ecosystems, the technology ecosystem, the entrepreneurial ecosystem, which on their own are robust, mature, well-funded, often legislated, but that's when you consider them in isolation. But when you consider them holistically, then you see the structural and the systemic issues that make them not operate, but make them operate in silos rather than holistically. And that's what the Digital Transformation Center is trying to mitigate, that kind of siloed approach to innovation and entrepreneurship. Thank you, Kiru. I think we will hopefully learn a lot from these panels that we can apply to your DTC. Uh, I would like now to go back to Norman. And um, I mean, you're doing all these things, Norman, and, and I really like the work GISA is doing, especially across Africa that I know. Um, but what do you need from this ecosystem? Because you have funding, sometimes you have some ideas, but what do you need from other stakeholders in the ecosystem? Can you elaborate a bit more on this question? Yes, certainly. Um, and I'm, um, it, it might sound a bit of a critique, uh, and it should uh, certainly up to discussion. I like what uh, Nicolas was saying earlier. We do all this because we we want to achieve something, and um, sometimes we forget what we want to achieve. So GIZ is certainly nobody who wants to invest. In equity or doing business when, when they're supporting startup ecosystem, but they want to support because uh, they want to, and that's the question actually, uh, create jobs, produce local innovations, um, connect uh, uh, companies, um, but also very different stakeholders like the public sector to, to with each other. And um, I think we, we cannot forget that this goal is basically, first of all, what we, what we need to achieve and then everything else comes. Now, what do we need from the ecosystem to do that? Um, I, I might have three or four, four points on it. One is kind of collaboration. For some weird reasons, and the donor community is part of it, um, there's a lot of things that duplicate uh, in the ecosystem. And I think uh, we don't want to have that. We want to have more like working together, even this sometimes means, um, uh, you know, leading your own stuff. Uh, and certainly competitiveness itself is very important, but not duplication when it doesn't make sense. The second thing I think would be, don't do the same thing like everybody else is doing. So the narrative of ecosystem comes from very much the Silicon Valley. So the idea is there's somebody in its garage and you know it's building its, its idea and then turns it into a business and becomes a billionaire very quickly. In an African context, it's not happening. It's very, very different. There's different stakeholders. You build your product differently. So don't do that. Do it differently. And, and this is where you have to engage um, uh, maybe with a totally different uh, group like also your clients and I'm saying I'm saying this because uh, I see very often uh, innovation for the health system it's not just copying something that elsewhere happened to work it is really knowing your client and knowing the health system and then trying to build your product for this and then my two minutes are over but I have a third point very quickly and this would be um, be ambitious in a sense but not from a narrative narrative itself but from where you want to go and I think that you, you, you have a lot of you know, stakeholders and, and intermediaries in the ecosystem that build a beautiful story. And this is very, very quickly told. But then obviously in every business and in every project, there is this period where you go down and where it's becoming very hard. And it will always happen. So it's actually going through that and not stopping you know, where the narrative stops. And I think it's uh, ambitious or having the breath to actually go where you, do, where you need to go to be built something meaningful is very, very important. So nothing will be built in a month or two or five or six. Yeah. Thank you.
Well, thank you, Norman. I think uh, I think in one of the previous panels, somebody was talking about 40 years to build the Israeli ecosystem. Uh, but, you know, we have Dr. Soglo here, and I'm sure he can tell us if we can apply Moore's law to ecosystems or not. Um, but that's actually a nice segue for you, <laughs> Dr. Soglo. Can you tell us how can, uh, what do you need from this ecosystem? Because you have a lot of programs. Are they finding their way? What do you need from government, from different stakeholders of the ecosystem, and even from entrepreneurs themselves? because we don't want to think of what you're doing as corporate social responsibility. We want to really see them as corporate social opportunity, which benefits both sides. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, moderator. Um, actually, in, in, in fact, uh, the very fact that we are able to have you know, this uh, session uh, today uh, shows that you know um, access to digital infrastructure, especially high speed and high quality broadband, is crucial. Uh, for example, you know this could be true uh, fiber, this could be true 45G, this could be true Wi-Fi, uh, but also we have the challenge of connecting connecting the unconnected, right, in communities. So all of these are crucial for the short and long term uh, kind of progress. Uh, of the small and medium enterprises, but also for the startups. Um, as Intel, we work with many stakeholders, right? Including government worldwide, including government, including standard organizations, including telecom operators, enterprises, and the ecosystem at large. And therefore, when we look uh, from the policy perspective, uh, we believe that there's a need for policymakers and regulators, uh, number one, to actually look at the existing national ICT policy or strategy and review them in order to incorporate the need to address this challenge of access to high speed and high quality broadband to connect communities. Uh, the second aspect is the regulations that are in place. There's a need to modernize those regulations to adapt to new technological development that can help you know, this access to broadband, but also have some regulation that will facilitate the deployment of those technologies. For example, site acquisition, for example, right of ways, for example, regulations such as technology neutrality, et cetera, that would allow stakeholders in the ecosystem to deploy new technologies. Now, to do that, you need access to spectrum, right? You need access to diverse type of spectrum. For example, license spectrum uh, in low band, mid band, and high band, as well as license exam spectrum. Having said that, uh, it is important to integrate ICT in education for the innovation and uh, to skill up young generation and entrepreneurs. For example, it, Korea is a good example whereby the integra integration of ICT in education actually help the development of the, of the country. So uh, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. I think those are all interesting points. And uh, we know that all these technologies are recombining much faster than any policymaker can actually do anything about. And in that sense, we really need to think of new ways to do policy. Uh, I, I'm gonna skip uh, some of our speakers to, and I'll come back to them to go to Kiru, who is from the government side and actually on the policy side. Uh, Kiru, I mean, you heard what Dr. Soglo is saying and you also here on your side, I know you're doing a lot to try to actually adapt, right, to this fourth industrial revolution. Can you tell us what you need uh, yourself from the ecosystem and, and how would you respond to what uh, Dr. Bienvenu is saying here? So, so thanks, Mo. Yes, so I think I mentioned earlier when I, uh, when I spoke that these ecosystems, you know, they structurally, there's, there's a structural deficit in them. Uh, to the extent that a regulatory and a policy intervention is sometimes required. So the, the, the mere fact of being able to operationalize innovation across these ecosystems may not be enough. They may just be outliers. What you actually may need to do is some kind of policy intervention because the challenges are historical, the developmental challenges that we have. And what we're trying to do, is we're trying to foster innovation at scale, right? In order to address these, 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 these challenges. And we want to strengthen the coordination between these ecosystems. We want to build synergies between them. We want to leverage existing relationships and agreements with regional and international partners. 
And we want to develop a meaningful framework for development of bankable projects. So that's what I think is my response would be to, to, to the good doctor. Thank you, Kiru. And I think I have just add to this is that in the DTC, for example, there is going to be a policy agility component which will be provided and offered to the ecosystem as a place where there will be like a sandbox where you can have those policy discussions. And um, now I, I want to go back to Nicholas. Nicholas, I think you're doing a lot of policy advocacy. You have stakeholders from both public and private, uh, from city uh, leaders into this digital Switzerland what do you need from this ecosystem and um, that you may not be getting or even if you're getting it, like what do you need right now from to make digital Switzerland even better? Maybe it's connecting digital Switzerland with other ecosystem. Maybe your focus is just digital Switzerland today. Nicholas, the floor Thanks. is Thanks yours. for the question. Um, no, I believe we should not be nationalist somewhere. It's not the solution. The world is big enough. And one of the solution is definitely We've heard already very good points. So you need a political framework, which is rather liberal, open-minded to immigration, to technology, to investment. So that's one of them. We need lots of patience. I believe it takes one to two generations, so up to 40 years, to develop a very strong uh, ecosystem. It's not, we all want to do it in two, three years. It's impossible. It takes a lot of time. It needs uh, this public and private sector really working together. Maybe after the last question, I'll bring one anecdote about it. And we need alliances in the world, totally agree. It's not about doing it on your own. You will fail against the two big ones. We need alliances in the world. Um, I totally agree on this one. And maybe the last one, each ecosystem, you know, like a point we say here, cannot be digital everything. It's impossible. We won't be Silicon Valley tomorrow. And even Silicon Valley is not digital everything. So rather find one, two, three topics you really want to own and be one of the leader in the world. This is our opinion about what we expect and what we want to give to the ecosystem. Well, I'm very happy to see, uh, perhaps we can find ways to bring you to South Africa so you can bring some best practices mm -hmm. in South Africa and other projects as well. Um, I want to turn back to uh, Lorenzo. How do you see this topic? What do you need to actually uh, from this ecosystem? So you, you, you're putting up all this framework, you, you're trying to foster all of this innovation. What do you need that you don't have today as an ecosystem builder? Yes, yeah, so uh, thanks for the question. Uh, I think that what, uh, the main thing that we, we give to entrepreneurs, what they need for scaling is twofold, or is access to market, or is access to capital. Very clear. Um, in this way, what we're doing is to really build up meaningful relationships within different ecosystems to support entrepreneurs that are growing. Uh, this may be through partnerships, through procurement, through investment. So different activities that, uh, that can enable entrepreneurs to really move forward and uh, uh, reach new milestones. So what we need from the ecosystem is really uh, open doors, uh, opportunities for entrepreneurs uh, that are tackling different challenges from uh, climate change, health, education, social inclusion. So these are not the classic entrepreneurs that are coming, that are using uh, technology for profit. They have a strong purpose beyond profit. So these mission-driven companies are totally different. Uh, and that's why it's important to build meaningful relationship that can support an enabler, uh, enable also a um, fair relationship and meaningful uh, opportunities. Thank you, Lorenzo. I, I think those are interesting points because uh, you really need the partnership. Now, if you're talking about doing this global, you need them in different countries. And, and I'd like to turn to Eric because he said they're building a network and this network could be perhaps a connection for you or, or perhaps we can understand from Eric how they do this and then what does Eric need from the ecosystem? Eric, mm. the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. And, and Lorenzo, I, I fully underline what you, you're saying. Is, um, many of the social, environmental, 
uh, and, and other main issues in the world will be challenged and, and um, solved by entrepreneurs. And it, it's these mission-driven entrepreneurs that I see coming up more and more uh, and that need a, a launch pad into reaching maturity, reaching their goals, reaching full impact. Um, and I think what they need uh, is um, to be elevated above their own local birthplace and, and region where they start um, testing their, their, their either products or, 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 or mission-driven uh, services. Um, and this elevation can be done digitally and, and it should be globally. Um, and this is, I think, both what uh, EY and our, our startup and tech ecosystem tries to offer, which is our global reach, um, but also what we see as a challenge uh, that um, how do you elevate really good, innovative, impactful ideas uh, to global level or to the places where they can thrive and take the next step. So this is both still the, the ask. I think we need to th yeah. all think of how we can connect more on a digital level and more on a global level and both an offering to you and to the uh, people in your networks that if you feel there might be a, a way EY can uh, help them with our reach please let me know well thank you eric i think it goes back to the point that was made earlier from norman all these duplications all these things mm. i mean can we find a way to really create a stronger network and bond between all these different ecosystem and all these players like yourself? Uh, you, you did raise an interesting point and, and you actually had a lot of empathy for our entrepreneurs, right? We'll turn to our entrepreneurs soon when you say they need to be elevated beyond their birthplace so they can test their ideas, et cetera. Uh, I, I wanna go back to uh, Khadija. Karija, how do you respond to this and what do you really need? You got into your need a bit. You said you want more Khadijas, right? Everybody to think like Khadija. Actually, I think this is your slogan and that's a great slogan, right? So how can we have more Khadijas in the world perhaps? Uh, Khadija, the floor is yours. So first of all, Mari, I, I did not say we needed more Khadijas. <laughs> so let's start with- Well, I hacked it, so space here um when you uh Meneer de Heer, when you said um that we need to go beyond our birthplace i um myself as an entrepreneur i'm actually someone who went beyond her birthplace because i was born and i grew up in belgium uh the um the arabic speaking world where today i am leading jaula um jaula is a um, content management software for right to left languages um, it allows bloggers, independent journalists, and writers to publish on the web in Arabic, um, Urdu, Farsi, and Hebrew, which are all languages that, start, that are starting from right to left. And that also allow um, those to provide a great reading experience uh, for um, audiences that are, I would say, non-Latin scripted. Um, and so for me, coming to the Arab world, a world where I did not grow up, that I do not know, that I, of course, of which I understand the language, um, was an opportunity for me to both locally understand the culture and to come up with my, I'd say, Western um, education. Now, entrepreneurs like me, what they need from the ecosystem is definitely more money spent on ideas. Um, there is a, there is a, a belief um, in entrepreneurship that you do not need much to be able to create a product. Um, interestingly enough, in our team, we are three women um, and we each have a component of our startup. Um, so basically there is one on UX, one on coding and one on business. Um, but even then we need money to pay for certain services. And so far, okay, as a team, we managed to um, raise 60,000 from the Google News Initiative, um, but to, to fundraise a further bit, um, such as 25,000 that we need now, it is very, very difficult to find those seeds uh, and pre-seed funding even 
for such little amount of money um, because of the, the loss that was caused in the past, because of the money that was thrown out, um, because of COVID-19, because the money has now shifted. Uh, people want to uh, find solutions to uh, vaccination and to uh, whatever, digital health or digital, yeah, basically it's health tech, um, but not other problems. That's number one. I think number two, there's also the language component that we do not speak um, as much of, um, which is once we want to grow products globally, we sometimes forget um, that those products reach audiences of whose language is completely different and also whose culture is completely different in either um, using a software um, or even subscribing to a software. Um, there are so many challenges falling along the line of um, financial technologies, for example. Today, we want to sell our product and we're thinking, which, which payment gateway are we going to put that is going to accept payments from Tunisia, Morocco, Iraq, uh, where many of those young people do not have access to online banking, let alone a bank account. Um, so what I love about the, 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 all, of the, of all of the topics that you've, that you've been mentioning here is how much um, they're all um, very um, general, but how much they actually speak of very little topics. And I can speak about public policies and the lack of young people in the Arab world actually um, taking place and deciding for those public policies. Um, Youth-led initiatives in the Arab world are not taken seriously. And they're not included in public policies. Um, so I suppose what I need is more courageous conversations on the details of those uh, bigger topics. Okay, <laughs> I think you did unpack a lot for us. <laughs> Starting from the topic of it's a shame we're all speaking English now, not another language, and that we don't have translation for this. So this, but language. we can arrange for that. It's not an issue. Uh, but you did mention monetary component, which is real hard seed, seed money that needs to come. Uh, but also a lot about non-monetary, which was brought out by other people on this panel from EY to Intel, because those are all really valuable non-monetary, uh, you know, sort of, resources that you need. Uh, policy, we touch on a little bit, so we'll come back to this. But uh, Sean, I mean, you, you're trying, you've been trying this, you actually need a lot as well. And I recall you said you needed simple things as you need a lawyer, you need a, can you tell us more about what you need, Sean? And, and, and could other people help you with this, right? I mean, and I'm just speaking to the other stakeholders here because it's not just about giving money, it's about finding other resources, right? And, and I will come back to Eric later to say if they're doing anything along those lines in his network. Go ahead, Sean. All right. So what I would say is the greatest need in my ecosystem is a shared vision for the future. We have a lot of stakeholders involved in, you know, in providing incubation and providing policies, et cetera. But there's no shared vision as to what exactly we want to accomplish. And in the absence of that, what you find is that you may have different initiatives, but they all diffuse each other. And so it just leads to no particular outcome, which you really need to have a clear and quick and coordinated strategy and vision if it is that you're going to actually accomplish a specific objective. And so I say that that is a key thing. Now, the other thing I, I believe, and, and Khadija touched on it, is that of, I would call it inclusion. You need to get different perspectives, different voices contributing to what the shared vision is, right? And this, these visions then translate into policy. It, it translates into, allocating finance, it translates into who supports what particular initiative or what particular idea that an entrepreneur or group of entrepreneurs will be working on. So if we are to succeed together, and in order for me, being part of this ecosystem, whether it's in Trinidad and Tobago or the Caribbean, or I would dare say the world, we need to have a shared vision we need to have initiatives that collaborate and coordinate with each other. And we need to be able to 
test these different ideas and tap into support that we wouldn't necessarily get if everyone is, you know, an island unto their own self, right? Where everyone is just saying, okay, I'm doing this and I don't have to talk to anybody else because I, um, I can succeed on my own. And I think we really need to change that narrative that an entrepreneur is someone who is able to just, um, just do it, just get out there, you know, grind until it gets done that's not going to happen for the majority of entrepreneurs. And so if we're really going to build a system, an ecosystem that works for the majority, we need to understand how, what works for entrepreneurs, how to support them in terms of go to market strategies, partnerships, access to knowledge and information sharing is critical, right? But again, it all starts with that shared vision. Well, I think that's quite interesting because this is going to bring us full circle to collaboration, to how do we unlock? It seems like it's, it's, a, it's a chicken and egg game, right? It's a, you have to put something before. So if we have to put anything, you need to have that bigger vision from what I understand. Well, first, you need to have that vision that everybody agrees to, because I agree with you with many of the studies that we do in countries, we see that there is a lot of resources. Often, if you ask entrepreneurs, they will say it's about money. But in reality, there is enough money to get the ecosystem going. It's just that all resources, not money, but the resources come in different form. That needs to have all the stakeholders coming up with some kind of shared vision, and that vision needs to be big. Because honestly, when I look at many countries, sometimes what we hear is when you say, what's your digital transformation strategy? They only talk about e-government, but in reality, it has to include everything, you know, because that's how the starting point. Norman, I, I want to go back to you on the response to this. In your digital transformation strategy at GIZ, are you looking into fostering this sort of shared vision across the board? because that seems to be a real unlocking block. And, and if you could respond to this in less than one minute, because we're running out of time. Well, the, short, right. short answer, the short answer might be yes. Okay. Well, <laughs> yes, it's good uh, to know. <laughs> okay. But let me quickly say how we try to do that. So we do yeah. build so-called digital transformation centers uh, in different African countries. The biggest one is uh, in Tunisia, but there's one in Rwanda already. Uh -huh. it's, it's trying to concentrate a little bit kind of uh, the difference part of the ecosystem to unpack exactly this, the policy dimension, but also the tech dimension uh, and others. And uh, way quickly, um, I mean, to, uh, um, how do we access your resources? That will be yeah. one. Yeah. Right, right, exactly. I mean, and this is uh, where we try to build programs actually that, that either are very direct with funding or finances directly be available, or we actually have identified a gap, as I said earlier, uh, for example, connecting uh, the public sector with, for example, startup ecosystems, it doesn't need really money in itself, it needs an intelligence. So there we build rather the program, uh, you know, that, that brings that together. So uh, yeah, yeah we, we're trying to understand what it's needed. And sometimes I'm more kind of in the give directly approach, but sometimes uh, it's also not a matter of money, but more kind of, of uh, um, unpacking actually the, diff the different that I mentioned that, that I needed to bring something into life. Okay, well, thank you very, very much for that. Uh, now, uh, Dr. Bienvenue, can you tell us how we can actually utilize this or access some of the resources, great resources that Intel is providing to the ecosystem? Uh, 30 seconds, if possible. Sure. <laughs> thank you very much, moderator. Uh, 30 seconds pretty short, but uh, I would like to say that from our technology and, and, and processor perspective, uh, we power the digital infrastructure worldwide uh, from the edge uh, to the data center and the cloud. And globally, we support you know, different global and regional initiatives and share our technical and global policy expertise. expertise. Now, uh, we are also active, an active contributor to the development of digital economy ICT policies worldwide, uh, whereby we advocating for enabling environment, for example, for emerging technologies, if I'll give that example. One other thing I'd like to mention is the, our Intel AI for Youth program that I talk about, uh, which has the goal to empower the youth and entrepreneurs with AI skills in an inclusive way. So I'll stop there since it's 30 seconds. <laughs>
<laughs> I, I think we all will fail uh, the test of our storytellers from earlier in the week, but that's okay. Uh, Nicholas, how do we work with you and access the resources or the knowledge you have on Digital Switzerland to build and connect this global community? Sure, Mohamed, do I have 30 or 20 seconds? You have 30 seconds. 30, cool. <laughs> it's not every time a bit less. No. Um, no, no, just kidding. I will make it short. At the end of the day, it's all about alliances, you know, so let's look for strategic topics. I repeat meet myself a bit, I know, but I'm sure it's so key. Let's look for some topics where we can join forces, public, private together, um, to establish ecosystem with one focus. It doesn't matter which one, uh, but with one focus, that's the first one. And the second one, I believe, and it will be amplified in the next years a lot. It should be all for sustainability. We should not forget this one. Thank you. Well, thank you. I do look forward to seeing you in South Africa. So just whenever COVID is happening or not happening. But, uh, but thank you again. I think those are very important points. Um, Lorenzo, how can we access and work with Hatchco Lab? So um, our contribution um, is, is totally observable thanks to the positive impact that our uh, impact entrepreneurs are having on the planet and society. This means uh, helping kids, uh, students, uh, uh, protecting and, and giving loans to more smallhold farmers. So there are several ways where we see concrete and positive impact. And uh, I mean, it's observable uh, over there. Uh, closing the financial inclusion gap, social inclusion one, uh, a lot of education and climate change. So, for example, uh, offsetting your carbon footprint, like with great solutions that are supporting. So, uh, there are several ways, but again, uh, similar to what uh, Norman, Nicholas, and have been shared before also from uh, uh, Dr. Bienvenue, it's about connecting the dots within the ecosystem with players that can really make a difference. Okay, so we do look forward for you to let us know how we connect those dots and hopefully on your 30 second Twitter style, you will tell us that. Uh, Eric, it seems you're doing a lot for the ecosystem in various ecosystems. How can we work with EY to scale and amplify this work? Yeah, what, what I and my team in the Netherlands try to do is help individual companies, entrepreneurs, um, um, with with the network we have uh, and the knowledge we have and the understanding we have of how to grow their idea into something that makes impact. Um, and I know a lot of the colleagues around the globe that are tied to uh, young entrepreneurs, to ecosystem, do the same. Um, so I'd like to be the bridge for this network um, and offer to see if there's any need in any country uh, to have a connection to someone from EY that has a passionate uh, a passion for helping this these entrepreneurs with these ideas to see if, if we can add yeah help them out um, so yeah that's, again I think that that's what I can offer I think that's a great how for us uh, moving forward uh, <clears throat> Kiro what about you how can we work with you and the department so thanks, Mo. So I think as the DTC, the Digital Transformation Center, becomes operationalized and matures, I reckon there'll be lessons learned on how we address issues, which I think we're very happy uh, to, to, to then see if those lessons learned can be you know, transported and translated into, into other countries. That's for one. And just to say that, you know, in spite of what I've said, we have over 100 publicly funded innovation tech hubs and incubators in the country. We have a university system that's very, very mature. So there's a lot of research going on. We have national research councils, a lot of vocational stuff. And the DTC is just meant to bring all of that together. And I reckon there will be lessons learned as we mature that we, we can we can then uh, uh, cooperate and coordinate with our colleagues, yeah. Well, I, I think that's, that's a great, uh, great example, hopefully. But hopefully we can get other people to help you build this DTC as well or to contribute. Um, Khadija. Um, oh yeah, okay, I'm not muted. Uh, how can we... Um, 
How can we think like Khadija? Uh -huh. <laughs> you don't have to think like me, please. The world would be so boring. <laughs> well, then, then tell us how can we think and help entrepreneurs and 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 uh, you know learn from all of these learnings you have in terms of the Arabic content, the translation, the problem of. Uh, of actually this content problem, which is real in many, many countries, not just the Arabic world. I think in the French speaking world, we have that as well as, you know, so. I'll first start with how can you help entrepreneurs? We entrepreneurs need sometimes a second brain and a brain that is able to look critically at our business model and ask us the questions that we should be asking ourselves. That's number one. Um, and in all pieces, nothing. it's not about not knowing, it's about us keep continuing learning, but it's also us saying, okay, I think that's the question that I should have asked myself. Is this the right question for me to ask myself right now? Does it need to be solved right now? And what do I need to keep in, uh, to, to keep in mind? Now, in terms of um, content access, definitely Arabic is not the only language lacking content. There's a huge digital divide between um, English and other languages. Uh, French is one of one of them, right? There's more than 100 million French speakers in the world, and the the web is only 14% in French. It, it says a lot about okay, uh, right? Ch China Chinese, it's the same as other Hebrew, um, Arabic, Persian, Urdu. It's about who has access to the internet, uh, who contributes to it, and you can see, you know, through the language digital divide, you can see who actually owns the web. So, so if if I if I may rephrase, then where your ask or your sort of need will be that less mainstream, more of the content of the internet to other languages. Localize everything. Localize everything. Localize okay. Everything. So I'll take that as your 10 second Twitter feed and uh, <laughs> we're going to go to uh, Sean because Sean, now you're just going to give us your uh, 10 second Twitter feed. Yeah. Uh, which will seconds. cover the previous question as well. <laughs> Digital inclusion for a better world. Excellent. Digital inclusion is, is really important. And so if we are to actually, you know, be able to build a strong ecosystem and to be able to engage with all of these different key stakeholders, especially entrepreneurs, you need to include their voices. If you don't, then we're going to constantly be in this struggle. And I would say, always remember that, that you came, you, we were all children at one point in time, and now we have grown and to remember the past, remember the childhood, remember us as entrepreneurs are going to eventually inherit your you know, spaces in terms of what is in policy and business, et cetera. And there's gonna be a generation that's gonna follow. So okay. including yeah. our voices is key. So I, I guess uh, that's enough for our 10 seconds. Uh, Norman, 10 seconds, mm -hmm. your takeaway. Looking forward to collaborate. I think we have so much more to talk to about and connect to each other. Um, so thank you. Uh, Dr. Bienvenue. Uh, thank you very much, moderator. I think number one, we have to look at accelerating access to digital infrastructure, especially access to high speed and high quality broadband. Secondly, important to integrate ICT and in education for innovation. And ter thirdly, the need for policymakers and regulators to work with stakeholders to modernize the existing regulations. Thank you. I, I love that. This whole grassroots thinking about really getting things done is really super important. That's what we're missing. Uh, Nicholas, 10 seconds. It's all about the political framework. I love what you say, Dr. Bienvenue. It's all about talent, education, collaborating together. And don't forget, digital is only the mean to purpose. Technology is only an enabler, indeed. Uh, Lorenzo. 10 seconds. Uh, yes. Uh, again, uh, technology for good is what really can drive uh, sustainable change. And it's more needed now than ever. Excellent. Eric. Well, uh, thank you all for really uh, in inspiring thoughts. Uh, I would say let's find ways together to help great new ideas grow from local to global as fast as we can. So we are going to apply Moore's law for that. I'm a big fan of Moore's law. I think if we had applied Moore's law to ecosystem development, we're not going to wait 40 years, right? 
And uh, so, uh, and I think we really need to do this. I, I, I do understand the, the idea of waiting for 40 years because actually two generation is the limiting factor, but I think we have to find a way to, to democratize access to innovation a bit faster than that. Uh, Kiru, you have the last 10 seconds. Thanks, Mo. So I think uh, my, my message would be let's innovate at scale to meet our developmental challenges and let's look at structurally altering the system in order to do that. Excellent. Well, I think that concludes our uh, hopefully great debates and we can have great soundbite. I do really look forward to working all of you and to welcome you back in this community in the future. Uh, with that, I want to thank all of our panelists and, of course, the team working behind to make all of this happen. I mean, they've been working miracles. And uh, we will have our closing session, I think, at 3.20, if you guys want to follow that part. Uh, but you're more than welcome. But I do want to thank everybody. And uh, with that, this call the session closed. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.